Welcome everyone to this webinar on the little practice for psychodynamic therapy. My name is Alex Vash. I am with my everlasting companion, Tony Rumenaer, and we are extremely happy today to have three wonderful superstars, I should say, psychodynamic guests, Hannah Levinson, Jeffrey Binder, and Volney Gay. And I will start by presenting our guest experts for today. So Hannah Levinson is a professor at the Wright Institute in Berkeley, California. She has specialized in brief dynamic therapy and supervision for over 40 years. She has offered over 85 professional papers and four books, including the book we're going to be focusing on today, The Little Practice for Psychodynamic Therapy, and has released five professional videos with APA illustrating her approach. Volney Gay is Professor Emeritus at Vanderbilt University and a Training and Supervising Analyst at the St. Louis Psycho Psychoanalytic Institute. He has published nine books on religion, psychiatry, and anthropology, and Dr. Volney has also won multiple teaching awards from McMaster University, Vanderbilt University School of Medicine, and others. And finally, Dr. Jeffrey Binder is a clinical professor of psychiatry and behavioral science at Vanderbilt University. He has offered or co-offered over 45 articles and book chapters on psychotherapy practice, research, okay. supervision, as well as yeah. three books on time-limited yeah. psychotherapy. And oh, let's just make sure that we have... Okay, so I'll just say the last part again. <laughs> so Dr. Jeffrey Binder... Uh, who has published over 45 articles or book chapters on psychotherapy practice, research, and supervision, as well as free books on time-limited therapy. And I am sorry, Jeffrey, I do have to uh, embarrass you a little bit. He's one of my personal psychotherapy research heroes who worked extensively with Hans Strupp, did some of the most amazing psychotherapy research projects ever in the history of the literature. So I needed to say that, get that out of the way as well. So we are very happy to have all of you here. And today's topic is on deliberate practice skills training in psychodynamic therapy. Before we jump right in, I'm going to ask my colleague, Tony, to just give a brief word on our sponsor for today. Yes. Uh, thank you, Alex. So we're with the Sentio Counseling Center. We provide low fee, high quality online therapy for clients in California, adults and couples. We also do intensive supervisor training. Please consider us for your client referrals or supervisor training. The website is here on this slide. Thank you. That's it, Alex. Thank you, Tony. So we just want to start off with a single slide and a single little theoretical idea to get us started. And then we'll jump into the actual book and with Hannah and Jeffrey and Volney. And the one distinction that we want to uh, start with today is this distinction you're seeing on the screen between conceptual learning and procedural learning. We believe that this is one of the most important distinctions to be made currently in our field of psychotherapy, mental health, counseling, and that still needs to be addressed. Conceptual learning is all types of learning or teaching that involves reflection. So for example, when you're reading a psychotherapy book on theory, when you're discussing cases with your colleagues, when you're in a webinar, uh, whatever you are in the world, hearing other people talk about psychotherapy, that all has to do with talking about therapy and reflecting about therapy. And we want to say off the bat, that is absolutely crucial. We love conceptual learning. We love conceptual teaching. It is, of course, a fundamental part of becoming an expert therapist. What we have found is that often most training programs and most training opportunities actually are purely conceptual learning opportunities, but there is actually much less opportunities for procedural learning or getting procedural teaching. And by procedural learning, we mean learning by doing. And you see that image there. It's the difference between talking about the piano or reading about the history of the piano versus actually practicing the scale and getting feedback on your performance. So we believe based on a lot of research and literature that actually there's a gap here that we need to fill where we need to provide more procedural learning resources for therapists in order for them to really achieve their potential as therapists. 
And that is exactly what our wonderful guests today have done. They, as part of a larger book series for the American Psychological Association, now we have a series of books on procedural training for different therapy models. It's a very colorful, rainbow-like book series, as you can see. So each of the book of the books has 12 skill building exercises where any practitioner, student, uh, it could be someone just starting out or actually a more already licensed professional or a trainer or supervisor can take these skills and these exercises to repeatedly practice a key competency from that model. So in the case of today's topic, the book, The Lower Practice in Psychodynamic Psychotherapy, our free guest experts for this webinar, Hannah, Volney, and Jeffrey, developed, I should say, in a Herculean effort, painstakingly, 12 The Lower Practice exercises in order to really get some crucial skills of psychodynamic therapy in your bones. So not just being able to talk about it with a colleague in a confident manner, but actually being able to use the skill with real clients. And so with that intro, that's my rant. <laughs> we'll jump into the fun part, which is the actual talking about the books and the skills. And later, we'll actually have the opportunity for a, a short skill building practice together. So I want to get us started by throwing a question uh, to Hannah and Volney and Jeffrey. What you're seeing on the screen here is the table of contents for the book, or I should say more specifically, the 12 deliberate practice exercises that our guest experts have developed for this book. So each of these numbered um, uh, exercises are a skill building uh, opportunity for each of those particular skills. And I guess I'll just start, Hannah, if you don't mind, uh, maybe you can take the lead and others can chime in. I'd love to ask you, first of all, why is deliberate practice relevant for psychodynamic therapy? Why would anyone care <laughs> about deliberate practice, in your opinion? <laughs> yeah, in psychodynamic psychotherapy training, we really don't do much experientially. Uh, there's a, so much that that we, you know, absorb through workshops and readings and, of course, supervision. And then we do a lot of performance. I'm going to distinguish performance from practice. We do a lot of performance by actually seeing patients. But that's not the same as doing deliberate practice, where you really get to hone in on specific skills with repetitive practice and getting feedback. Um, and this is why I think it's especially important in psychodynamic work. Hey. I would um, add a little uh, history to um, to what Hannah uh, has been saying. Um, back in the 1980s um, at Vanderbilt, we did a, a study called Vanderbilt II. It was a classic study at the time, the largest um, study uh evaluating the effectiveness of psychodynamic orientation with, uh, we did it with experienced uh, clinicians, but we felt it could be generalized to students also. And um, what we found, we, we had recruited a number of uh, therapists, psychologists, psychologists, psychiatrists, um, who we knew in the community, well-respected clinicians in the community, and we uh, recorded their uh, 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 short-term therapies. They did 25 sessions with um, uh, uh, patients that we recruited. Then we put them through a year's worth of training and a model we developed uh, called time-limited dynamic psychotherapy and uh, expected to see improvements, particularly working with difficult patients. Um, which in Vanderbilt One, which was the uh, study that occurred before Vanderbilt Two, we uh, discovered that uh, even very experienced therapists had difficulty managing hostile process with um, uh, difficult personality disorder patients. Well, what we discovered in Vanderbilt Two, once we started analyzing the data, was that we really didn't have a um, much of an effect on the uh, practice of the clinicians who we had put through the um, the training. And 
the training was really um, uh, cutting edge uh, training for the time and still probably is it we use videotapes of their work and we uh, uh, looked at them and gave feedback and uh, they read our book and uh, we did all the things that um, are traditionally done in training. And uh, we realized that uh, we had made a um, an assumption which was really uh, not warranted, which is that the training that we were doing was, um, and that traditionally had been done in psychodynamic training programs was effective. Uh, so some of us, uh, myself, Tom Schacht, Steve Butler, uh, Bill Henry, we uh, started meeting with a cognitive psychologist at Vanderbilt, uh, John Bransford, who introduced us to something called anchored instruction, which was uh, uh, a cutting edge kind of instruction that they were trying out in uh, in high schools and elementary schools, where students learn basic concepts from science, math, social studies, English, in uh, simulated environments where they'd actually use the information that they were learning. So we learned about something that is critical and implicit in what um, uh, Alex was talking about, which is inert knowledge that the knowledge that you acquire in classrooms and uh, workshops is not easily applied in real world situations. It has to be transformed into procedural knowledge. And uh, um, it took quite a few years until Tony and Alex began to really um, uh, uh, disseminate this uh, uh, this is knowledge in the uh, community, but uh, it's very clear that it, it takes something like deliberate practice to um, really uh, prepare students to see real patients. I, I could add one comment to that. Mm -hmm. By the way, it's good to be old because I was on campus when Jeff uh, was doing those studies. I, I think one of the problems with psychoanalyst and deliberate practice, distinguishing them from others, is that they had presumed that each of their students or candidates would be in four times a week individual psychotherapy. That is an immense amount of face-to-face -face confrontation with oneself. So that's a couple hundred hours a year for three to four to five years. That does not happen in most training in anything in the world, except maybe the CIA. It's, <laughs> it's, it's just extraordinary demand on time. So I think part of the resistance to deliberate practice in a way has been the analytic overhang of dynamic clinicians that you read books, you go to seminars, you see patients, you have supervision, and you have your intensive one-on-one -on -one psychotherapy. That said, I, I'm very glad we spent all these years on deliberate practice for dynamic psychotherapy because the majority of our students are not going to be in four times a week psychoanalysis ever, much less when they're doing their uh, master's and, and PsyD and PhD programs. So I'm, I'm keen on that. Another thing I think Tony and Alex taught us with more clarity is learning probably does best when there's just enough anxiety in the student to be motivated, but not overwhelmed. And one of the clever parts of Tony's uh, style, especially, is to help us do graduated exercises and then have a feedback. Some, uh, Hannah talks about this in one part of our book, where the students want to get through the exercise, it should be it should be a little bit difficult and then stop. And finding that balance point is a is a burden on the teacher and on the instructors. If it's too easy, it's not good teaching. If it's overwhelming, well, that's not good teaching either. Amazing. And I would add uh, the point about feedback is critical that uh, 
the feedback that's offered in deliberate practice is the kind of feedback that you see the practice uh my um, practice uh with a musical instrument uh with a golf swing uh the practice that traditionally you get in in psychotherapy supervision is uh days or uh, hours or days later where you talk about something that even with a videotape you're talking about something that you actually did uh quite a um, uh, bit later than or, uh, than when you get the feedback and then when you go back to utilize the feedback you may encounter a different situation so uh, it's not a very efficient way to utilize what's one of the primary principles of um, complex skill formulation, which is immediate feedback. To just very briefly add, I always like to think that there's really nothing new under the sun. And exactly 20 years ago, I believe, Jeffrey actually published a paper called Is It Time to Improve Psychotherapy Training? In which he talked about, at the time, I think he used the expression anchored instru instruction which was your proposal for being more hands-on in really giving the principles and the competencies and giving feedback to trainees. And I'm sorry to say, Jeff, in 20 years, not a huge much might have changed, but it's so heartwarming to see that you're still at the vanguard of that, still fighting the good fight. It's following you guys. <laughs> so if I bring us back here to our slides, so we have here the 12 uh, skill building exercises that are part of your book. I guess a lot of people will be curious, and I'd love to, to ask you about this, is how the hell are you able to choose 12 skills out of the oldest, <laughs> most potentially most comprehensive psychotherapy model in the literature? I mean... I remember we had early meetings about how could we even choose from, you know, the thousands that you could choose. And I, I think everyone would love to hear how did you end up choosing these 12 exercises, these 12 focus for the skills? Well, I'm going to jump in here. I mean, this was actually one of the most complex parts about writing this book, because as you all know, who are attending, I mean, the varieties of psychodynamic psychotherapy you know, is enormous. But some work that's been done by researchers, uh, including Mark Kilsenroth, who's here today, thank you. Um, people have been finding out empirically by asking therapists, by combing the research literature, by seeing what differentiates psychodynamic, let's say from CBT, and they've honed it down to some basic concepts uh, that really differentiate the two, like for psychodynamic, the importance of early childhood, um, conflict, corrective emotional experiences, uh, interpretation and so forth. And so we wanted to represent with our skills those concepts as best we could. And I think the 12 actually do a pretty good, pretty good job of that. To add to Hannah's point, uh, Alex, you're quite right. We spent many a Sunday afternoon lamenting and kvetching, did I say that correctly? But also wondering how to answer your question. And one of the criteria, not the only one, but one was to focus on skills that were hard to learn or seem simple, but they're not simple. They're the kinds of things that a, a, an intelligent student can talk around. And Jeff made a point early in our work uh, on therapeutic inquiry, which was skill one, and he's written about this, but it, it was very helpful, I think, to put that first since it says to the student, when patients are mumbling or unclear or say things that are obscure, you get to say, I don't understand. Can you say more about ABC? And that was considered revolutionary. I, I don't know why, but in many training programs, that simple act of engagement with goodwill, but simply clarity uh, has been hard to teach and hard to find. So that's number one. 
And the second is therapist awareness, uh, which we call interactive countertransference, which again is uh, having a self-report from the student therapist about what I'm feeling now in response to him or to her. Now, it may not be something you share with the patient, but it is certainly something we want to register. And then later we'll talk about a skill of working with the supervisor. And those are the contexts in which it's valuable as a, as a clinician to say something honest. Like when this patient came in, I didn't like him very much or the reverse, or, or I felt bored. All those little micro moments are normal, expectable sources of information. And yet, and yet typically hard to talk about. It's uh, fascinating to me. We have, as I've shown before, we have done a few of these door practice books so far, and yours stands out as being particularly comprehensive, also in the, the different types of uh, focus in the exercises, because as you just mentioned, Volney, there are interpersonal skills, like we see here, for example, pointing out the fences, but we see inner skills or intrapersonal skills, such as increasing the therapist's own awareness, and I would say even more creatively, wonderfully, skill 11, for example, a skill around communicating issues in supervision. So you're really covering a lot of bases here, which is just wonderful to see. So having said that, there's another element because there's so many uh, moving parts to these different exercises. I'd love to also ask you about the issue of testing these exercises, because for uh, participants, attendees here, uh, for them to know is that our authors didn't just come up with these exercises and just publish the book. They actually did test these uh, with real students, uh, different groups, video recorded them, getting feedback on them. And Hannah, maybe we could start with you asking you, what was your experience trying out the skills, seeing what works and what didn't, what lessons did you learn from that? It was a humbling experience, Alex. Very, very humbling. Um, by that, I mean, as you can probably tell, uh, Jeff Volney and I could could talk for days around concepts. And, and so we would get into these discussions about, well, how are we going to help someone practice corrective emotional experiences uh, or making an interpretation, a transference? And, and we would end up with like 10 criteria, you know, that the person would need to meet in order to fulfill this very complex uh, task. Mm -hmm. And then we tested them. And it was complete cognitive overload for the uh, trainees and experienced therapists, because we also had experienced therapists try out these exercises as well. And so very humbling. How could we get an exercise that would work, be meaningful and relevant with two, three, four criteria. And that's where we really had to be thinking through, how can we do this? And that's where the testing was invaluable. Wonderful. So I think maybe, I mean, we're talking a lot about the skills and the list of skills you've uh, developed for this book. I think now we should actually show, <laughs> not just tell. And so how about we focus on one of the skills from the book? And I believe that for today, we agreed to focus on skill number four, making process comments. So maybe you can set this up for us, Hannah, Volney, uh, and Jeffrey. We, so I'll just briefly mention how this works, but also I'd love to hear from you about the specific exercise more broadly. So the way a deliber deliberate exercise, sorry, deliberate practice exercise works is we develop what's called skill criteria, which are these colored statements, numbered statements up here. And the skill criteria really are the observable therapist behaviors that we believe define the skill. Because one of the problem with most skill building in our field is that it's, uh, you know, when you're trying to practice a skill, it, you're talking in jargon and it's in the too broad level in order for it to actually be practicable. So our offers, what they've done is they've taken a skill such as making process comments and decomposed it into observable therapist behaviors that can be practiced 
and that supervisors and trainers can give feedback on. And so this particular exercise, there are three skill criteria. The first being that the therapist should start by asking permission to take a look at what happened right now between the therapist and patient. The therapist should then name what just transpired between therapist and patient to the best of their ability. And then they top off, they finish off their intervention with one of two options. Either they end their intervention by inviting the patient to explore their feelings about what transpired, or they end the intervention by conjecturing about the patient's feelings about what transpires. And we'll see a, an example just in a moment. But before we get too deep into this, I want to ask Hannah, Jeffrey Volney, anything you want to add to the importance of this skill and the development of this exercise? On Hannah's point, I would say each of these took time to refine, clarify, refine, get up. And this is, this is the latest version, and I'm happy with it, uh, especially the two options. I, I, I think that is humane and realistic to the student and so to the patient. And the other is uh, the first step is a, I hope, universal sense of respect that the TV psychiatry and TV psychotherapist, for lots of reasons, I suppose, don't ask permission. They, they say things that are distressing or upsetting or quote, interpretive and uh, basically awful. Now, it's funny if you're a patient of Fraser Crane, I suppose, but here, th this quality of uh, Criterion One, I think that permeates the book, and I'm, I'm glad it does. Yeah, thanks, Volney. I also might say that making process comments is... Uh, so much a part of doing psychodynamic psychotherapy, where we're really looking at what is going on in the here and now, right? Right in the in the therapy room. And so this first criterion, asking permission, not only is respectful, but it's also getting the patient to focus on something is occurring here interpersonally between me as the therapist and you as the patient. And I would like to draw our attention to that. Um, trainees get very caught up in the content, right? There, there's all this fascinating content to talk about. And so much of it is relevant, of course, to the work we do. But um, a good psychodynamic psychotherapist is always looking at the process. And so I think this exercise in particular gets the trainee to start thinking about process and not content. Yeah, I would um, just add one brief uh, uh, comment that I don't know, I can't, I guess we did plan this, I assume we did, that some of these exercises um, are preparation for later exercises. This is a good example of it. This exercise is a practice for making a uh, more advanced version of a process common, namely transference uh, interpretation, which is an exercise that comes later. So uh, that's another um, uh, um, characteristic of, of these exercises that uh, I think uh, more effectively prepares students for doing real therapy with real patients. They exercises build on each other. And I think, Jeffrey, you're also touching on something very important from a pedagogical standpoint, that we want to practice skills that build on each other and also in a developmental fashion, where you start with something that is a bit simpler, though probably not easy, and you build on that over time in order to be able to do more complex skills. Great. So... And Oh, go ahead, Hannah. Han. Yeah, I just want to insert here, following uh, uh, Jeff's insightful comment, that um, at the same time, while we build skills, we're also um, creating skills that allow students to practice important procedures, but no one will really ever do that particular intervention in that particular way. You know, if, if you're playing basketball and you're practicing shooting hoops, 
nowhere during a game will someone stand exactly in that place and shoot the ball 50 times, right? So we shouldn't be thinking, oh, I'd never say it that way in a real session. Well, of course not. You would be adding who you are. You'd be adding the context. You'd be adding nuance. But this is getting to the basics. So I think that's an important thing for people who are very sophisticated in psychodynamic therapy to realize that we're not saying, yes, just go in and do it like this, one, two, option one, option two, right? Um, this is to practice doing something that then ends up in your bones. And then you can really improvise and add your authenticity. I could add though that writing the book clarified for me better than before the exactitude of these skills. You know, I don't know about you, uh, the both of you, Jeff and Hannah, but I, I'm not sure I changed what I, well, I think <laughs> I think I got simpler. I, th I think it helped me simplify communication. Uh, that's, you know. oh, cool. Well, let's see how it actually plays out, the actual exercise. So we have the three criteria again, the three main therapist behaviors. And so let's see an example here. We start off with a, a very small context for the client situation. So the context here is the patient has been talking excitedly about their new book project. The therapist glances at the clock on the wall behind the patient. A very familiar situation for everyone. So client says in a confused manner, well, uh, now I forgot what I was saying. How odd. Anyway, now I feel kind of hopeless. Therapist could make a process comment following the criteria, saying, can we take a look at what just happened? So that meets the first criteria of asking permission to take a look at what happened. So therapist says, can we take a look at what just happened? You were speaking about your new book project, and when I glanced at my clock, you forgot what you were saying. So this meets criteria two, the therapist naming what just transpired between the therapist and patient. Finally, the therapist has two options here. So we present here both options. Therapist could end by saying, I'm wondering what my looking at the clock meant for you, which would be option one, inviting the patient to explore their feelings about what transpired. Or the therapist could say, did you think when I looked at my clock, I wasn't interested in what you were saying? Which would be option two, conjecturing about the patient's feelings about what transpired. So a fairly rich, fairly complex uh, exercise. I should say, I just rem I'm just reminded of something funny, I think. In all our books in this uh, APA series, we divided the exercises into beginner exercises, intermediate exercises, and advanced or hard exercises. What we realized for the psychodynamic book, though, is that there were no beginner exercises. All the exercises had such a richness to them and multiple moving parts and criteria that all of them had to be considered at least an intermediate level of difficulty. And uh, do you want to comment on that? It sounds... <laughs> Yeah, I can uh, I can really relate to that. And and also um, one of the other things that I think distinguishes the book from other books in this series is that uh, we did contextualize uh, the information about patients because in psychodynamic therapy, you, you just can't practice saying something to a generic patient. It's so it depends on who is that patient and their background and so forth. So where we could we also um, kind of gave information about the, the patient so that the student would get practice saying one thing to patient A, but not the same thing to patient B. Right. Same exercise, but not the same content. And so um, just for everyone to notice, of course, the criteria could be met in many different ways. Different therapists would meet the same three criteria seen here in many different ways, with different words, different styles. And this is really what we're getting at with the lower practice. We're not training therapy <laughs> robots. 
We're not interested in people just repeating blindly the same words. What we want is for them to flexibly, in their own style, be able to practice these criteria, the principles underlying the skill. Right? So we thought we could do something fun, and we have a lot of attendees today. So everyone who wants to join, we welcome you to join us. What we're thinking of doing is actually inviting whoever wants to join us on the Zoom chat right now and try writing on the Zoom chat a therapist response that would meet these three criteria. So I'm going to read aloud a new client prompt and we'll give the attendees a minute to try improvising, writing down in the Zoom chat a response. So the context is the therapist asks the patient a challenging question about what the patient was feeling as they were talking about something upsetting. Client then says, mm -hmm. are you going to be here next week? So try writing a response, meeting the free skill criteria for this client statement. And then Hannah, Jeff, and Volney can provide some feedback. So I'll, I'll go ahead and read the response. Um, and so here, here's the first one. It's in the chat. Uh, the response is, could we talk about what just happened? Pause. It's 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 generic and to the point, and it's in the scope of the exercise. The it may be too generic because it isn't clear. It might not be clear to the patient what that referred to. Whereas it seems that the issue is the um, suddenness and the surprise about about the patient's question. That's so more, it, go ahead. So more specifically refer to uh, what what just happened. Right. And, and and there's variation, but 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 naming it from your perspective would be a, an option here to say when as as was the example. When you when I said when you, you said ABC, I said DEF, and then to my question, you change and ask the question about next week. So I'm I'm puzzled by, I wonder if something happened here between those two events. Right, so in deliberate practice terms, uh, the response uh, meets uh, the criteria one, because it's asking permission, but does not meet criteria two and three, which would be specificity and then also inviting or conjecturing. Uh, right, there's a nice comment here too, um, Wendy. Right. So here, here's another one, uh, another uh, response. I just asked what seemed like a difficult question, and then you shifted to asking uh, about me being here next week. Can we look at if something is happening between us? Well, I would say you've nailed uh, criterion two. Name what just transpired between therapist and patient. But I would wonder about option one and option two, where we're being very explicit here about inviting the patient to explore the feelings about what transpired. Um, although I think there's absolutely uh, nothing wrong with what the person uh, offered and I think meets the spirit of option one. Great. Here's another one. Uh, something interesting just happened there. Can we slow down on this and try to understand it? You seem to be feeling upset. And when I asked you this question, you asked if, asked if I was going to be here next week. What was it like for you when I asked you this question? Perfect. Check, check, check. All three criteria. Here, nice job. Here's, 
Here's another one. I want to highlight the uh, diversity of responses. Uh, how we are, you know, one of the concerns that we hear about deliberate practice from psychodynamic uh, practitioners is like, oh, it's going to turn my trainees into robots or, you know, you're giving them canned lines to memorize. And you're seeing it's actually quite the opposite is everyone gets to experiment with discovering their own style of therapy and having very different answers. So here's another one. Can we slow down a bit and see what might have just happened for you just now? I asked you a question about how you felt when blank, and it looked to me as if something happened inside of you that you shifted the topic to next week. I feel there is value in exploring what might have happened for you. Would that be okay? I love the criterion that got added. I would want to put that one in if we could make it a four criterion exercise. <laughs> I uh, I appreciated the nuance of that. Which is the criteria that was added? I missed that. Um, just read the ending, Tony. The, yeah, the value. The, that, would it be okay? No, the, the last part. I, I'm sorry, I, I could look at it myself. There, there is value in exploring what might have happened to you. Ah, right. I see. Okay. Right. It's a, that it's would a, be a fourth criterion, it's an right? Additional, it's an additional invitation to take part in the here and now. So so this is a great example of what just transpired is I, you know, I missed that. I didn't, I was like, oh, this is mean. Uh, however, our experts here are like, oh no, that's a whole another criteria. That's a, that adds substantive value to the response. And so what we're seeing here is if I was the trainee or as I was in, you know, a class with these dream professors here, I would be learning more about the little micro skill components of the responses and basically doing a, a textual analysis or almost like a coding of the responses as part of just routine training. Uh, Tony, I wanted to uh, respond to a comment you made about uh, what you're hearing from uh, lots of uh, psychodynamic uh, uh, teachers, the idea that uh, this kind of uh, training will make what we're trying to train robots to do the therapy. Um, in fact, uh, one of the characteristics of expert in any uh, complex performance domain is the ability to be flexible and to improvise. Uh, the analogy I think uh, you two have used is the jazz musician. Somebody quoted uh, Miles Davis saying that it takes many years before you can play like you. Um, the, our view is that traditional training doesn't really prepare students to be to to be flexible and to improvise, which is one of the uh, uh, cardinal characteristics of psychodynamic treatment. This kind of training bakes in the basic skills that allows you to improvise and to be flexible. So, ironically, the uh, th that that criticism actually. Um, uh, is uh, the opposite of what this, uh, the goal of this kind of training. Thank you for highlighting that Miles Davis quote I snuck in there in the book, Jeffrey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, this is often very surprising uh, to, to folks who are not used to this. Um, we're, we're actually uh, creating a fertile ground to foster uh, trainee uh, flexibility, responsiveness, discover their own style in rehearsal where they're allowed to, you know, make all kinds of mistakes, right? Like when I'm training, I, with, in this rehearsal, I can try all kinds of things and get feedback and there's no patients are harmed by it. And, and it's not only no patients are harmed by it, as, as I've said uh, before, and as uh, the two of you have talked about eloquently, that deliberate practice is, is failure facing which is to say we're trying to take the shame out of learning, right? Where you either get it right or you're wrong, you're good or you're bad. It's like you keep going in deliberate practice, being challenged and challenged and challenged. If you're not being challenged, you're really not doing the work. And, and so this builds up a different atmosphere in the classroom actually, uh, where now uh, there's not an embarrassment about getting something wrong. There's just an eagerness to get it right. 
right? Like likewise, uh, something that's worth highlighting is so far all the responses that I've seen are, you know, at, at least at very least in the ballpark. And so we're we've got experienced psychodynamic practitioners here, which you know is not surprising for this webinar. And so, but we're still seeing some opportunities for subtle refinement, for subtle improvement. And so this, this, the exercises are designed and I think will be effective with not just beginning trainees, but more advanced practitioners. That's, that, is our, that is our hope. Well said, Tony, exactly. It, can I read one more response here? Um, this was from earlier. May we pause and take a look at what just happened. When I asked a challenging question about what you were feeling, you changed the subject to ask if I'm going to be here next week. I'm wondering if you were feeling uneasy about discussing your upsetting emotions right now. Yeah, lovely. Yeah, uh, also Mark Mark Hilsenroth did a pretty good job too. <laughs> By the way, that's well, not surprising. That's surprising. But, yeah. but let me read Mark's uh, for the group. I'm happy to answer that, but first I'm curious if I can ask you a question too. It seems that when I asked about your feelings, about your difficult situation, you changed the subject. I wonder what you think that happened. So there it is. We're please hold on. That, that was someone else's Tony. That wasn't mine. Yeah. Oh, good. There's two more. Yeah, that was his a different is, Mark. His is, his is three Oops. down. The, the, okay, here's the here's Mark Hilson Roth. Sorry, we have multiple marks here. Mm -hmm. Would it be okay if we pause for a second? You were just describing something upsetting. And when I asked about how you might've been feeling, it seems something changed. I wonder how it was for you to consider the feelings you were experiencing. Uh, I think that's pretty skillful because mm -hmm. it hits all the criteria and it emphasizes the, it emphasizes the empathic interest and mentions again feeling so it, it it it's it's not tendentious it it it's a focusing effort to come back to F, which is one of our general goals in dynamic therapy right uh, eft to me is a subset of dynamic therapy and perhaps we are a subset of eft but the affective focus is pretty much essential mark also did a little two step there um he brought it back from interpersonal to intrapsychic, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Brought yeah. it back to now, I wonder what was going on for you, right? With the feelings you were considering before, you know, this other interruption. And uh, so that that's another way things can go, both the interpersonal and the intrapsychic. Uh, interesting thing that I just wanted to also mention is that uh, we just focused on one single client statement and look at the richness <laughs> that we got, not just in responses, but also in feedback. So our brave experts here, what they actually did is for each of the Dolor practice exercises, there are 15 different client statements from which to practice from. And also there are 15 example therapist responses that trainees might check out, model their intervention from, and get some additional feedback from. So you can imagine with 15 client statements with such a rich uh, skill criteria, you could take a few hours or a few different sessions, the lower practice sessions, just to get through all of them. And our suggestion is that you don't make it a point to get through all of them, to take your time and just digest each skill, uh, each client statement, each example therapist response. And it, it will last you for a while because I know uh, our offers took their sweet time also to be able to come up with all the client statements and all the responses. Yeah, it, in fact, so at Sentio, we, uh, we use all these exercises for training uh, beginning trainees. Um, so these are first year uh, graduate students often, uh, and then also training supervisors. And something we found is that uh, repeating, you know, at first we were like, okay, we want to get through all the exercises in a semester. And then we found actually students benefit from repeating the exercises multiple weeks in a row. It's almost like the first time you go through them, they're really just getting oriented to it. They're kind of understanding it. They're 
you know, and then it's the second or third week where they're repeating it, that they're really getting to flex their muscles and try it out and compare their responses to the expert example responses and that kind of thing. And so I would encourage, I, I know there's a lot of professors here and supervisors here. I would encourage you to kind of dig into the exercises, especially the ones the students respond to well, and uh, not necessarily feel like you got to get through all of them. Uh, that names the ideal that uh, Alex touched on a bit ago, that these exercises connect each to the other, that this is a network of ideas and, and orientations and values, really fundamental values. Um, you could name uh, empathic engagement or otherness or uh, other and self. And, and in that sense, it would make sense that you can go back to the same exercise continuously. It, it's, 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 these aren't randomly uh, uh, um, associated. In the advanced dynamic exercises like making the transference interpretations, you will find every, of the, every one of these skills involved, especially self and clarity involved as well, which is one of the great uh, intrinsic humanizing values of therapy. It's the, the patient and the therapist are in a dyad. It is not top down, focused down. It's a different kind of world. I'm aware of time, so I, I want to be respectful of everyone, but I also want to have a few last minutes for kind of closing remarks. So the book is out. You can get it. I'm putting again the, the link to the book on the Zoom chat. Uh, I encourage everyone to to get it. Uh, and I just want to ask uh, last time, Hannah, Jeffrey, and Volney, any last encouraging words for the brave people <laughs> who are considering doing some dolor practice, be them trainees or licensed professionals? I think our book is a is a companion book to most classes at initial and immediate levels. I, it's not didactic. We don't have um, histories and theory and explication. It's not a conceptual book, but it's the best we could do that is a companion, as I say, and a complement to the top-down intellectual world that most universities and most programs specialize in. So that's there. We think we can add to it. Yeah, I agree. I might just say that in the testing that we did, the students loved it. They found it challenging. It was anxiety provoking. And they said, I wish I would have had this. So that's very gratifying when you're sitting there kind of working by yourself on an exercise or when the three of us are getting together and tearing our hair out. Uh, Jeff has lost some of his as a consequence of our work together. Um, but if... If, if all of that is worth the students saying, you know, this really makes a difference. This is helpful. Thank you. So that means the world to us. And if you use this book, uh, chances are you won't see too many students falling asleep during the <laughs> Very hard to fall asleep when you're anxiously trying out new stuff. <laughs> And I also uh, want to end by saying that um, the two of you, Tony and Alex, want, you couldn't have asked for better editors, uh, guidance, and, uh, and able to you know, hold someone's hand when the going got tough. So thank you very much. Yeah. I could have asked for them, but we would, wouldn't have gotten them. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much. You're uh, welcome. The, congratulations to the, the three of you. This, you know, of all the books we've done, the psychodynamic psychotherapy has, you know, eased the far and away the more the most rich uh, theoretical basis, the most rich literature, and the the work you did to synthesize all that and come up with you know practical exercises that are accessible to grad students is just it's just monumental and. Um, we're, we're hearing great reports of people using it in the field. And oh, so congratulations. Super, super.